Hey world, my name is Dan Brown, and this is the very first episode of Wombo Storm. Yeah, it's the craziest show on the internet about the craziest format of Magic the Gathering, that is to say. It's a show about Commander, that's why it says it in the lower right-hand corner of my screen right here. I'm wearing a witch's hat, because, I don't know, witches are magical beings, and this is a magical show about the game. Let's get into it. Got an email. Hi, Dan. I've always been very interested in figuring out how to make cards which are ostensibly bad work in a way that makes them integral to how a deck functions, whether that's through making them combo pieces or finding ways to make them situationally powerful in the context of a deck I'm building. Thankfully, Elder Dragon Highlander is a format that rewards experimental deck building, but I still have not won a game with my one with nothing deck. All right, line break here, kind of new thought. One of the types of cards I always find fun are the cards that would be otherwise good but have huge drawbacks, and one of my favorites is Final Fortune, and it's slightly worse cousins, Warrior's Oath, and Last Chance. With a little setup, these are just Time Walk in red, and playing with one of the Power Nine is pretty attractive, even if you're skating on thin ice with the potential to just up and lose the dang game. I'd love to see your take on making any of these cards work, or maybe a different set of cards with big drawbacks that make them unplayable. Being able to make the unplayable into powerful is one of the coolest things that a format like EDH, aka Commander, lets you do that other constructed formats just, they, the other constructed formats just don't have that on command. That's the thing you can only do in the wildest, craziest version of Magic the Gathering. Keep up the awesome videos. I, uh, I'm gonna try to pronounce your name here. I think it's Eowyn, but we don't have that name in the United States of America. Not not very many people do anyway. I don't know anyone with that name, so apologies if I butchered it entirely. All right, a lot to unpack here. Um, first of all, a lot of card names you were throwing out there. I'm going to hear, hear the... Okay, the first one was One With Nothing. This is not the direction that I decided to go in for today's video and today's deck. However, I maybe spent a little more time on Scryfall uh, searching for ways to try to break this. A little longer than maybe I'd care to admit for a deck I didn't wind up making. But I did find Barren Glory right here. I think, I think, 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 maybe there are other ways to do this, but I think this is probably the best way to try to break one with nothing in Commander. Drop a Barren Glory and step before your turn Cast one with nothing, discard your hand. You'll need to already have Claws of Gix on the battlefield so that you can sacrifice all of your lands to themselves, right? And then you'll probably also want some mana rocks that generate more than just one mana, like Soul Ring, for example, or Worn Power Stone or Thran Dynamo. That way you can net some mana to ultimately sacrifice the Claws of Gix to itself. And then with the Baron Glory trigger on the stack, hopefully your opponents don't have a stifle <laughs> or a way to, I don't know, what's that orchard that can give spirits? That would really rain on your parade, wouldn't it? Uh, I digress. I, I, definitely possible to make a one with nothing deck. This is how I would try to do it if I decided it was ultimately worth my time. But because you gave me two options of things to go with in your email, this one just, it just piqued my interest a little bit more. I mean, I don't know. Call it a coin flip. Call it a die roll. I chose to go with Last Chance, Final Fortune, Warrior's Oath, Tribal. There they are. You can read what they do. You're probably familiar with them. Last Chance and Warrior's Oath are exactly the same as Final Fortune, except way, way, way worse because they're sorcery speed instead of instant speed. But that's the only difference. Take another turn, and if you don't win during that turn, then you lose. <laughs> it's an all-or-nothing strategy, but... Um, if we're building a deck around these, the obvious question is, how do we get around the lose the game trigger? All right, so I spent some more time on Scryfall, some advanced Magic the Gathering search, and there's uh, the better art for Final Fortune, in my opinion, for a deck we're calling Final Fortune Tribal. First of all, Angel's Grace. This one is probably, I mean, it's just the first in alphabetical order, but it's also probably the best way to try to dodge the lose the game trigger. You're gonna see as we go on, every other way that we have to dodge, or most other ways, if they get countered or dealt with, then rut row, you're just gonna lose the game. <laughs> that trigger's gonna resolve and your game is over. Which, you know, thousand foot view, understanding that the real game is the meta game and the real win condition is having the most fun. Like the most fun nights of Commander I've ever had have been nights when, you know, the power level has been maybe not CEDH, but pretty high. Like people playing kind of combo decks that are very skill testing, uh, a lot of stack interactions, but the games also move pretty quickly, not like grindy control stuff. So, so from the thousand foot view, from the metagame perspective, if you just lose the game pretty quickly, that means that 
the rest of the players, most likely, you know, the game will go a little faster for them and you can get more games in on the night. You can have more data to sift through when you're editing your decks after. So I, I like this deck because even when you lose the game, like that's, I mean, you, you tried, right? <laughs> you had fun. And as a result, uh, your play group is probably having more fun too. But Angel's Grace, pretty much guaranteed. It can't be countered because it has split second. And, you know, it's not like you're countering the trigger itself. It just says you can't lose. And that remains... Um, you know, uh, a, a state of gameplay that you have for the rest of the turn. So uh, lose the game trigger just doesn't do anything if you've cast an Angel's Grace. Days Undoing is the next card I want to feature. It's, it's a card that has, I think, been looking for a home. A lot of people are like, is this just Time Twister in Modern? And it's not. All right, I don't know that it has found a home really in, in any mod. I'm not an expert on modern, so I'm just talking out of my butt a little bit. But uh, it works really well with Final Fortune effects because it ends the turn. And when you end the turn, that delayed trigger that's waiting for you when you get to your end step just gets, it disappears. It vanishes. So Days Undoing not only refills your hand, not only is a uh, wheel effect, but it prevents you from losing the game after time walking. Um, so it's pretty good. Then we have... Some more standard options here. Disallow, Stifle, Trick Bind. I, I like these cards because they are also just good in a vacuum. The same is true of Days Undoing. Like, there are situations in the abstract where even if you're not playing a Final Fortune tribal deck, they're still just really good. Disallow, obviously really good. And Stifle and Trick Bind, you know, th there's some really interest I mean obviously really interesting ways to interact with things that your opponents are doing in ways that they aren't going to expect opponents aren't generally expecting their activated and triggered abilities to be dinked with right once their spell once their creature with an enter the battlefield effect resolves they're like well I'm gonna get that ETB effect but you're like not so fast I gotta stifle but you can also stifle trick bind or disallow they'll lose the game trigger to not lose the game to your effective time walk. Um, another way to do it is to just end the turn. That's what Days Undoing does. Um, time Stop does it really well. Time Stop's a ridiculously good card. I mean, it costs six mana. A little bit spendy for a control effect. That's a lot of mana you have to leave up. But it deals with everything. You can use it as a counter spell. You can counter multiple spells on the stack at the same time. You can use it kind of like a fog if someone's swinging at you for lethal damage. Uh, you can use it to dodge lose the game triggers from your own final fortune. Uh, it's very good. Sundial of the Infinite. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. But it's an end the turn on a stick, which opens up one of our infinite combos in this deck. And then Glorious End... Uh, yeah, uh, it's a delaying of the inevitable. It also says at the beginning of your next end step, you lose the game. But it can wipe an earlier lose the game uh, end step trigger from the stack and then give you a chance to deal with instead it's lose the game trigger next turn. It buys you some time. It Maybe you could consider it a bubble card, but I, I really think that there are a lot of interesting tactical lines to play with Glorious End in this deck. I, I think it is kind of a, a more neat card. I mean, it's already a neat card. This is definitely the deck to run it. Um, there, there are ways to take advantage. So, all right, all right. Isochron Scepter. Next card I want to feature. This is how you, one way to, well, I think it's the only way to go infinite in this deck. You have to imprint Final Fortune. The other two versions, the uh, Last Chance and Warrior's Oath, they do not work with Isochron Scepter because they are sorceries, and Isochron Scepter demands that you uh, imprint an instant. But Final Fortune works. Imprint Final Fortune on Isochron Scepter. It only costs two mana to take an extra turn. And then as long as you have a Sundial of the Infinite in play, you can just end your turn every time you get a new turn and take infinite turns. Now, of course, like I said before, you are <laughs> playing with a really, really dangerous glass cannon here. If an opponent deals with your Sundial of the Infinite uh, in response to you activating it, I guess, like before the end of the turn activation resolves, if they blow it up, then you're going to be stuck with an extra turn that you're losing at the end of. And if you don't have another way to not lose the game, then you're just going to lose the game. But <laughs> I guess that is... Uh, if you're playing this deck, you've already accepted that that situation is going to come up from time to time. So, yeah, this is an infinite combo. This this takes infinite turns. It's pretty neat. Um, another way to just up and win, our, our other way... Well, and maybe the only way, actually... Like, I don't know what you're really doing with infinite turns in this deck. Maybe you can just swing a bunch of times with our commanders, which we'll get to in a bit. But, uh, yeah, H Hive Mind. Okay, if you jam a Final Fortune or Last Chance or Warrior's Oath... With a hive mind on the battlefield, then what's going to happen is, well, let me back up. Let me read hive mind. Whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery, each other player copies it. 
Each of those players may choose a new target for their copy. So that last little block of text doesn't really matter, but everyone gets a copy of this. So what that means is everyone is going to get an extra turn that they lose at the end of. <laughs> uh, it's not quite that simple, though. Uh, it, it, oh, man. Hive mind. If you play with hive mind in your deck, your play group is going to learn new things about how magic works when you get to a really, really granular level. What do I mean by that? Okay, so let's say let's let's actually walk through it. Let's cast our last chance with hive mind in play. What happens is our last chance goes on the stack. Then a hive mind trigger goes on the stack right on top of that. Okay, let's assume that no one's interacting. Hive mind trigger will resolve. So then all of your opponents. All of my opponents, let's say, will get um, a, an extra turn. They'll get a last chance of their own. So the opponent who comes after me in turn order is going to have theirs go on the stack first, then the player after them second, then the player whose turn comes immediately before me, assuming a four-player pod, uh, is going to have theirs go on the stack last. So the player to my right is going to have their copy resolve first, creating an extra turn. Then we're going to go in reverse turn, or turn order to resolve these just the way the stack works. Okay, but the extra layer, what really puts us over the top in terms of needing a deep understanding is the ruling that extra turns happen in the reverse order that they were created in. It, basically, they work the same way that the stack does. They're not just like sitting on an actual stack. It's like a, a meta stack of extra turns. All, all of that is just a very, very, very long way of saying that when everyone has a last chance resolved because of hive mind, because you ran a last chance through the hive mind during your main phase, yours is going to, be ha is going to have to be dealt with first. Which is to say, if it was the opposite, right? If yours was to actually happen last, you wouldn't even need to do anything else at all. All of your opponents would take their extra turns first, and they'd lose the game at the end of their turns if they didn't somehow win. Uh, and then even if you had a lose the game trigger waiting for you at your end step, you would never get to that end step because you would win the game by default because all your opponents would have lost. But that's not how it works. Instead, yours happens first, which is why um, Glenelendra is on the screen here. Also, uh, she is one way that you could counter your own copy of Last Chance after the Hive Mind trigger has gone on the stack. You could not use a normal counter spell. No instant or sorcery, I guess, and no, no instant that counters a spell would be viable here because that would also trigger Hive Mind. And then all of your opponents would also have a counter spell that they could use to either counter their own Last Chance copy or they could counter your counter to force you to lose the game. There's just some ways that could go wrong. So you need some sort of creature-based counter or, 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 the or in the bottom right of the screen here is because any of these eight other ways that I've already described uh, to avoid the lose the game trigger at the end of that turn. Uh, it doesn't matter if your opponents get copies of these with hive mind because, uh, you know, what are they going to do? It's too late for them to counter their own copy of Last Chance, and they don't have the opportunity yet to counter the Lose the Game trigger because it's not sitting on the stack just yet. It's a delayed trigger for them. Blah, 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 blah. Um, also, <laughs> have Grand Abolisher because it's a combo deck, and it's just a good way to ensure that your combo is going to go off, that opponents can't really interact. I don't run a ton of counter spells in this deck, so Grand Abolisher is just, you know, kind of put it out there. You don't have to every time. If your opponents are tapped out, kind of read the table, but just a good little extra bit of insurance before you try to combo off. Uh, then I run 10 tutor effects, nothing too interesting about them. They're just tutors, search your library for a card, help hit the combo more consistently. Uh, 10 draw effects, uh, showing you a few more examples here because there can be some variant. Like every deck runs some sort of a draw engine pretty much, uh, but there can be some variance between those draw engines. So like compulsive research and brainstorm here, pretty efficiently costed ways to dig relatively deep into your library. Um, Phyrexian Arena, just generic good stuff. Sphinx's Revelation, kind of a bomby draw effect. You know, if you have a Sphinx's Revelation or a Stroke of Genius in your hand, it's just a game plan in and of itself in lieu of any other like better game plan. So kind of an... Uh, array, a, a diverse array of ways to draw, but with a, a little bit tighter of a curve. We, we are playing pretty much a combo deck right here, so we want to draw, 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 draw. Um, control, we have nine effects, and many, most of them, are wipes of some sort. I love Austere Command and Merciless Eviction just because um, they're versatile. You don't have to blow up just creatures, but a lot of the wipes are just creature wipes. That's fine. You know, it's a way to get a little bit of card advantage if you are blowing up multiple cards for just one card. Um, 
That's pretty good. It's just a way to reset, reset, reset. Buy yourself some time before you can combo off. We also have 15 ramp effects. Again, nothing too crazy. They're all artifacts um, for the most part. And 38 lands, that's my standard number. If there's no reason to add one or two or take away one or two lands, then I just, I just don't touch it. Land count is kind of sacred. I, almost, I n never cut a land unless you've really, really, really thought about it. Um, also, uh, this doesn't really fit in any particular category, but there's a temporal mastery in the deck. Uh, two of the ten tutors are Mystical Tutor and Vampiric Tutor, and any deck that's running those, might, you might as well just add in a temporal mastery. It's just so, so, so good. And in a deck that's already trying to take extra turns for two mana, you know, it, it, it seems to fit, even though I can't, like, neatly put it into any other category. Temporal Mastery is also in there. Um, and, yeah, we got Commanders. This is a bottom-up deck. So I didn't go into this knowing who the Commanders were going to be. I just picked out all the cards I wanted. I was like, all right, what colors am I in? Turns out I'm in everything but green. So not that many options. And Silas and Akiri. Uh, so I, I actually like them for a couple of reasons. First of all... Having partner commanders means that our main deck is only 98 cards. It's not an enormous statistical difference, but it is a very, very, very subtle statistical difference. If you play 100 games with this deck, the fact that you have 98 instead of 99 means that you're more likely to draw into your exact combo piece you're looking for or the tutor that you need to fetch it up uh, just a, a little bit, ever so slightly more frequently than you would if you only had one commander and 99 in the main board. Also, because we're running no creatures virtually no creatures in the 99 i'm actually not certain about that right this second but uh it, it's nice that our two commanders are cheap little blockers that we can just put out there to make sure that all else being equal a vanilla 10 10 isn't punching us in the face four turns in a row uh, you can recast them relatively cheaply silas is nice because if someone has cast some sort of artifact wipe he can help you rebuild your board and we do run enough artifact ramp that akiri can very often be a pretty efficiently costed little blocker out there you know if you have two extra mana at the end of some turn might as well get her out there might as well have a blocker you never want to be the one player without a blocker that is the deck if you have an idea some card synergy some just anything at all that might be inspiration for some sort of deck that maybe you want to see me build here on Wombo Storm. Uh, my email address is danbrownuniverse at gmail.com. It's right there on the screen for you to take a look at. Go ahead, just send, write me a nice little note. Write me an email, and who knows? Maybe next week you will see your email featured in an episode that features a really weird magic deck. Let's, uh, let's goldfish this deck. Let's see what it does. Shuffle, 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 shuffle. We're going to draw our opening hand. That looks decent to me. It has a little bit of ramp. It has enough lands. It has a tutor. And it has some card draw, like a mass card draw in the form of a stroke of genius. And a chaos warp is just a little bit of spot removal in a pinch. Yeah, that looks like a super solid opening hand. Let's go to turn one. Uh, we will draw Thrandynamo. Never a bad thing to see. I guess we'll drop a Bloodstained Mire and go ahead and crack it right away. What colors are we missing? Definitely need a black source and a red source. I, I, I guess we're gonna fetch up exactly the colors that it lets us fetch for. Um, so we're gonna go black red, that's called a blood crypt if we're gonna shock land, let that enter tapped. Well, we could let it enter untapped and just immediately vampiric tutor. Uh, we do miss out on a little bit of utility from the Vampiric Tutor uh, in that we can't just grab the Temporal Mastery for an extra turn for value. And uh, yeah, all else being equal, it's good to wait on your tutors until you know which is the last combo piece you need to get. If we tutor for a combo piece right now and then we draw into something redundant with that combo piece, we're going to be mad that we didn't wait because it only costs one mana. Like, yes, you do have to wait until the next time we draw to actually get the card in our hand, which could be a critical tempo loss, but I digress. We're in the weeds here. Let's go to turn two. Untap. Draw. City of Brass. Don't hate it. We'll go ahead. And why not just get a command tower out there for two? Drop an Orzhov Signet. Uh, just rampity, rampity, rampity. Turn three. Untap. Draw. Main phase. I'm going to stop and think here. We have four mana potentially on the turn, which would be enough to drop a Thran Dynamo, but we're not doing anything with the Thran Dynamo right away. We could also just hold up a Chaos Warp, and if we're doing that, then we probably want to just get the Scalding Tarn in play as our land. I'm, I think Scalding Tarn is probably the right land drop. Once you get into four color and you have multiple options for early game land drops, the, the sequencing and the prioritizing can actually get really complicated, and that you know, you're only going to get better at that with 
experience, and even with a lot of experience, you're still going to mess it up all the time. And so, especially playing against a goldfish right here, you know, the opponent is hypothetical. In, in a way, I guess, there's no wrong way for me to do it. I can just claim that my opponent's board's my goldfish's board. Looks however I feel like saying it looks like. Anyway, yeah, anyway, dropping Scalding Tarn. Um, cracking the Scalding Tarn during an opponent's turn. Holding up a Chaos Warp. But let's say we don't have to use it so early. Actually, you know, let's be conservative. Let's say I do fire off a Chaos Warp. I don't know. Some opponent's doing something crazy. They hit their Soul Ring just to really put a stick in their spokes. And the Scalding Tarn's going to get me. Definitely need a blue source. Definitely want... We have black, red, blue... I don't know. Uh, there no doubles. D double... Um, colors in the casting cause of things in our hand so I don't know blue something <laughs> oopsies dang it I did not draw a mountain I'm just gonna something with blue in it we're looking for something with blue <laughs> yeah sure no not a steam I'm gonna go blue white but that's already in my hand so let's uh, yeah whatever watery grave seems good uh, it'll enter tapped well <laughs> again we could let it enter untapped and take a shock and then fire off a vampiric tutor we're not gonna do that Turn four, untap, drawn, worn, power stone. All right, so we're, we're kind of starting to get somewhere right now. Uh, Fran Dynamo into worn power stone feels pretty good. Yeah, let's just go ahead, drop this city of brass. Yeah, here's the play. Then we're gonna say for one, two, three, four, we'll drop a Thran Dynamo. Then for one, two, three, we'll drop a worn power stone. And then, um, we're gonna set before our turn, we're gonna cast a vampiric tutor. Search our library for a card. Uh, it's going to be a temporal mastery. Uh, wherever that happens to be, give me a second. Just, I just it's so hard to search. It's like, there it is, Cut. temporal mastery. We're gonna put that on top of our library. We're gonna move to turn number five. Untap, draw. Oh, look at that, it's a temporal mastery. We're gonna cast it for its miracle cost. Uh, just blue, yeah, I guess we, we kind of have to awkwardly just tap one of our better fixers uh, mana wise from a land just to get the casting cost just right without losing mana. So then on the turn what we're gonna do main phase we're gonna drop a Hallowed Fountain, we're gonna take the shock on that and then we're gonna say for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine mana cast a Stroke of Genius for six emptying our hand one, two, three, four, five, six. That's a boring Stroke of Genius, goodness. Move to our extra turn we will untap. It's still. I'm still counting it as turn five because this is an extra turn. We will draw Grand Abolisher. You know, a little bit of get there potential. Drop an exotic Orchard, and we just have lands. We do a lot of lands. I mean, obviously we're playing the Phyrexian Arena. Let's say one, two, filter one of those through here, and then add a black. That works. Uh, Phyrexian Arena. That's going to be good for just drawing extra cards and extra get there. Um, and then we're just holding up a trick fight. I guess this would be a great time to drop a Kiri just to have a blocker. Um, sure, Kiri's out there. Do we want to get Silas out there? We don't have any artifacts in our graveyard, so um, probably better not to play Silas unless the board is full of a lot of like mid-rangey ground threats that we need extra blockers for. But usually one blocker, you know, two blockers is not twice as good as one blocker, right? One blocker um, is kind of the critical mass where you get the most value. We'll go to turn six, so, you know, entering the mid game, untap. Uh, beginning of upkeep, we will draw an extra card, then we will draw a card for turn. Dark Petition. I do like a tutor at this point in the game. Um, I don't know, play a... We, we're actually hard-pressed for red sources. I will just drop a mountain as my land for turn. Go ahead and organize my board just a little bit here. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 mana available to us on turn 6. We have been ramping effectively what is the most brutal thing that we can do with a dark petition think 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 now, this, I, this is just a weird brew that i came up with pretty recently so my knowledge of the cards in the deck is not fully encyclopedic so you know, it might take me a second longer here uh yeah, let's, i know i know i'm gonna want to cast that okay one two three and filter for black and then make another say it a, yeah, black like that that's fine. uh dark petition go ahead and take a peek at what we have, what our options even are. Not gonna get a mana rock, that's for sure. Um, hive, hive mind, maybe. If there's just some some way to, I mean, if if we're not finding some way to like start a Rube Goldberg machine that ultimately wins us the game, 
then what we're probably looking for in this situation is a way to just refill our hand. Now, Decree of Pain is a very interesting option. You have to get into kind of hypothetical land a little bit to um, you know, guess how many creatures would be on the board at this point, but we definitely have the mana to fire it off. Uh, it would refill our hand. It accomplishes what I was just explaining. Uh, we can also try to get like you know, to use a last chance, maybe increasing ambition tutor for a tutor that then becomes a double tutor. Um, but yeah, the more I sit here and think about it, the more I feel like decree of pain is probably the best bet. So we'll go ahead and snag that. It's a secret. We don't have to reveal it. That's just in our hand. Then dark petition is going to yeah. We definitely have yeah yeah yeah. We have more than enough instants and sorceries. So we're gonna get. Black, black, black. But we're going to immediately use that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mana. Uh, drop a Decree of Pain. Blah. We'll destroy all creatures. So a Curia will cost a little bit more, but that's okay. We're definitely drawing one card. Let's go ahead and just say we're drawing five cards. Let's say there are five creatures on the battlefield. I think that's pretty conservative. One, two, three, four, five. Um, and we still have three mana available. Um, I did play that mountain this turn, I'm pretty sure. So no, yeah, it is just three mana left. And a big, big, big hand. We're still not comboing off, and we still haven't even used Final Fortune in any way, shape, or form, uh, as advertised by the deck title. But, that's, you know, sometimes when you are shoehorning in a really weird card synergy, you know, most of the deck is still just supporting that and ultimately getting to that. Um, you know, what would we do here? We can we could drop Mana Rock, Mana Rock, and then we only have to discard a few cards, and then that sets us up for a Sphinx's Revelation and or Demonic Tutor um, next turn. Yeah, why not? I'll go ahead and say for 1-2, drop a Mana Rock, get that in play, then for 1-2, drop a Mana Rock. We're super tapped out, like, you know, the opponents might be able to interact in some way without us, you know, being able to bluff a counterspell or trick mind if we really wanted to. Although, they're going to be rebuilding their boards anyway, because we cast a Decree of Pain and destroyed all four of our opponent's creatures. Uh, yeah, let's go to turn seven. Still, like, still the mid-game right now. Draw. Ooh, Terminus. We have an opportunity to miracle a Terminus, although we're probably not going to use... Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and say we do it. Let's say that our opponents dedicated their turns to rebuilding, and we're just immediately like, yoink, hap, sorry. Uh, and then... That Terminus just goes to the graveyard, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not Temporal Mastery. Uh, main phase. We have so much mana. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 mana. 15 if we play a land, which we will. Um, just, I don't know. Caves of Coilus. What difference does it make? And then... Ah, 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 we, ah, ah. Probably Sphinx's Revelation? I mean, do we... Do we Demonic Tutor into some kind of an extra turn and then Sphinx's Rev before that extra turn? How much, how much can we do that for? If we do Demonic Tutor for two, then we cast a Final Fortune for two more. Then that leaves us with three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven mana um, to put into a Sphinx's Revelation, which we could then eleven, ten, draw eight cards, which hopefully we can win the game after doing something like that. Yeah, I think, I think we're going to go ahead and go for it on turn seven, and if we don't get there, then... We don't get there. <laughs> uh, let's say, yeah, one, two, doesn't really matter. We'll cast a Demonic Tutor. We will FN at three to look for, uh, let's say, Last Chance. Let me go ahead and snag a Last Chance. And we will cast it by paying red. And, oh, I don't know, there's another red right there. We're going to get another turn after this turn. Uh, but before we do that, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, well, we could cast Grand Abolisher right now. Um, maybe should have done that before doing anything, any of this. But I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We'll drop a Sphinx's Revelation and draw eight cards, gain eight life. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, there it is. We drew a Mystical Tutor, an Increasing Ambition. Um, you know, we have a Lose the Game trigger at the end of this turn that we're going to need to deal with, but we have more than enough tools to deal with it. Uh, we're going to have to discard down to hand size. Oh, I think I missed a draw trigger off of Frixian Arena, but who, who's counting at this point? Um, yeah, those are going to discard. That's going to discard. We probably don't need a three mana mana rock. Probably don't need a two mana mana rock at this point. Nine, a, and we'll call that seven cards in hand before our final turn, before we lose the game. Untap everything. 
draw a soul. Never a, it's, the soul ring is never a bad card to draw. Go ahead and drop an island, play a mountain, get that soul ring in play. Why not? All right, so we have to not lose here. And we can maybe... All right, we, have, well, we just have so much dang mana. There's, there's, there's probably like eight different ways we can win. Um, and we can Final Fortune into another... We, we can tutor for another Final Fortune effect and then tutor for a way to deal with it. I think, yeah, increasing ambition is definitely going to be the play. One, two, three, four, and call it a black mana there. Oh, yeah, we drew an extra card out of Friction Arena. I keep forgetting. Cast it. Increasing ambition. I will search my library. And then at three, right there, four uh, Warrior's Oath. Why not? We're going to put that into our hand. And then might as well uh let's just let's fire off that warrior's oath let's say red red i might not be tapping my mana as intelligently as i could but we'll get that out there i have another turn stacked up after this turn but i lose the game at the end of this turn so that extra turn doesn't matter right this second but we're gonna pay a white and then another white go get that grand abolisher out there probably should have done that a long time ago but again who is really counting here um and i need to save mana for a trick bind which means I still have three, four, five, six, seven left. I could like overload a Cyclonic Rift and still trick bind the trigger and have the extra turn. But maybe a better idea. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Overloaded Cyclonic Rift is almost never a, a, a bad play. There are you know better times and worse times to do it. But let's. I think I want a mystical tutor right. For, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, okay. All right, no. Here's what we want to do. We want to flash back increasing ambition. What am I thinking? That's how we win. That's our out. It costs eight mana to do that. So I got to double check that I am not going to run out of mana. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that only leaves us one mana for a trick find. So we can't do that. <laughs> I, uh, I should have played that Grand Abolisher earlier. No matter. We can do it ne next turn, I think. Uh... Ooh, I played myself. I played myself here. I moved too quickly. Let's just, yeah. Let's let's do let's do a let's do a mystical tutor. Why not? That seems good. A mystical tutor for some kind of an instant or a sorcery. That um, oh, days undoing seems interesting right now. That might be better. Uh, or we could. Uh, oh man, I'm trying to move fast. I'm trying to move fast here, and that's my downfall always when doing these deck tech videos. We could also, yeah, you know what, yeah, you know what, what are we going to do? We are going to take a deep breath, Dan. What are we searching for? What are you searching Well, we could get a stife. No, but that only goes on top of our library, so that doesn't do anything for us right now. Yeah, you know, well, days, but we can't draw the days undoing, right? This second is the thing. That's the thing. So we just want to probably put to search for Final Fortune, right? Wouldn't it just be Final Fortune? Uh... Yeah, let's, I, I think that's what we do. And then we can, yeah, yeah, Final Fortune is going on top. And then we'll go ahead and one, two, three, four, five, six. So then we do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nah, that's not, okay. So we're just going to play two mana, whatever, Azorius Signet, get that out there. And then end step trigger. We have one, two, three. I keep trying, <laughs> I keep being one mana short of doing anything other than just trick binding. So we'll go ahead and just for two mana. Trick bind the trigger, we don't lose the game, and um, we have another turn stacked up off of the Warrior's Oath. Go ahead and take that extra, extra turn right now. Untap, we're going to upkeep, we're going to draw for Phyrexian Arena, there it is, then we're going to draw for turn, Talisman, whatever, Tally me a mana. Uh, then, okay, 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 I think we're finally there. Thank you for bearing with me. I know it's been very interesting. And we're going to flash back an increasing ambition for eight mana then exile that so one two three four five six seven and we'll get a we'll get a black through the ores off signet flash it back search for two cards fnf3 here we go we got the grand abolisher out no one's gonna have anything to say about us snagging a sundial of the infinite right and then we just need uh, uh isochron scepter okay right and then that is going to do it that is going to be the game because what we can do is then for one two drop a sundial of the infinite 
Then, uh, where did that, where did it even go? It's hiding, it's hiding back here. There it is. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. And then, for one, two, we can cast the Isochron Scepter. They're gonna keep hiding these things. I need to drag and drop them. We need to drag and drop. Then we will imprint a final fortune onto the Isochron Scepter. I'll go ahead and attack, attach it to card, attach it to card like that. And then we'll take an extra turn for two. And then we'll end the turn at the end of that turn and keep doing this infinitely to make a bunch of extra turns and draw our whole deck. And eventually we're gonna get to, uh, no, the hive mind was right on top. And uh, yeah, actually, do I have a way? Did I already, I already used my warrior's oath and my last chance. I need a way to get those back from my graveyard. I don't know, do I run away to get those back from my graveyard? Maybe not. Uh, I'm just gonna draw forever and take extra turn. Days Undoing, Days Undoing would do it. That would do it. We'll draw Days Undoing, cast it, and then end the turn that way, and then take an extra turn, and then eventually draw into the Warrior's Oath with a, uh, whatever the heck. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the Hive Mind right there. Hive Mind in play, and then our opponents will all lose at the end of their turns, and uh, it will be glorious. Glorious! Ha-ha! Hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> I sure did. I've, I'm having We We do have fun. Yeah, that, 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 that's it. Remember, the real game is the metagame, and the real win condition is having the most fun. Good luck, and have fun, and call your mothers. Thank you, and I'll see you soon on another episode of Wombo Storm.